Hello and welcome. Today we will be evaluating a scholarly article about ethical issues in animal cloning, written by Dr. Orn Fiesta, published on the 1st of June 2005 from the University of Pennsylvania Center for Bioethics in Philadelphia. Dr. Fiesta has used a series of st studies to form deontological and utilitarian arguments in regards to all sorts of animal cloning, but we'll be zooming in on the agricultural animals in particular. Before we can begin to analyse the ethical issues and concerns, we need to have a sound understanding on the cloning process. Clones can be defined as genetically identical copies of a cell or an organism. After lots of speculation in the mid 20th century, Professor Ian Wilmot and his team created Dolly the Sheep in Scotland, 1996. Before this experiment, it was thought that once stem cells had undergone differentiation to become specialised, like nerve cells or epithelial cells, that they couldn't be the basis for generating an entire organism. Following this diagram on the screen, a white-faced sheep's udder cells grew under resting conditions where they would have a similar state called the G0 state to the embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are undifferentiated cells within a human embryo. These cells can specialise to become any of the three primary germ layers, the ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm. Their pluripotency distinguishes them from adult stem cells, hence why Dolly the sheep was a reality. Parallel to the udder cells, the team removed an egg cell from a black-faced sheep. The nucleus of the egg cell was removed with a very thin needle and then they used electric shock to fuse the G0 state udder cell with the nucleus-free egg cell. These fused cells were then inserted into surrogate sheep mothers who had black faces. The team had created 277 fused egg cells, but only one of them developed into a lamb. She was named Dolly. She had a white face because she had the same DNA as the sheep who was the udder cell donor. Hence, we can say that Dolly is a clone of the udder cell donor. Years down the track, Dolly was able to give birth to Bonnie using the natural reproductive process. Dolly the sheep was the start of an exciting new chapter in science, as it allowed for the development of new ideas and technologies. In fact, scientists are now able to manipulate the clone's genes using a process called pronuclear microinjection to serve particular pharmaceutical or agricultural purposes. In the years following the sheep experiment at Rosslyn Institute, their scientists engineered sheep to secrete a human protein called Factor IX that assists in blood clotting. The genetically manipulated clones were capable of producing milk that contained Factor IX and was used to help treat patients with haemophilia B. Similarly, cloning was used to enhance cattle milk composition and milk processing efficiency by a group of researchers from Otago University in New Zealand. They were able to increase the casein concentration in the cow's milk by introducing additional copies of genes that coded for CSN2 and CSN3 proteins into female bovine fibroblasts. Casein is the main protein that humans gain from drinking milk, which helps reduce muscle breakdown and fibroblasts are cells in the connective tissue which produce collagen and other fibres. The transgenic calves produced milk that had 8-20% to higher concentration of casein, which is basically top-notch quality milk. There are more examples, such as manipulating chickens to have no feathers to reduce environmental costs of poultry farming, and pigs whose manure has less phosphorus and helps reduce environmental pollution. It's evident that cloning can be beneficial to all parties, using the same science, humans, the environment and the animals themselves can have respective gains. Cloning isn't a revolutionary movement. It's seeking limited change to parts of the population. Animal support groups and activists would have a degree of concern such as pain for the animals involved. But on the other hand, patients with diseases such as haemophilia B would benefit from cloning as we discussed earlier. Farmers are involved in the agricultural cloning process as well. Many would be interested in having cloned animals. Within one generation, they can have a full herd of animals that are products of clones, allowing them to make accurate predictions about the herd's productivity. They would also be concerned for the lack of genetic variety within the gene pool. If a herd of clones have identical DNA, they would all be susceptible to the same genetic disorders. Whilst cloning primarily has an impact on the parties we've mentioned, it's also a popular debate for the general public. Dr. Fiesta's original article used statistics from a 2004 study conducted by Lydia Saad from the Gallup poll. A thousand adult USA citizens were telephone interviewed about whether or not certain dilemmas are morally acceptable. You can see the results of the other dilemmas in this graphic. 
64% of participants believe that animal cloning is morally wrong. However, only 32% believe that it's morally wrong to conduct medical tests on animals. The comparison to completely different ethical issues such as euthanasia, which is seen as more acceptable in this poll, is shown here. In a different article wrote by Pamela Paul, previous 2001 Gallup polls revealed that 56% of Americans with postgraduate education and 52% earning $75,000 or more say that animal cloning should be permitted. This series of data holds grounds for us to say that supporters of animal cloning tend to have higher levels of education and higher household income, but does not account for who has actually made an informed decision regarding the issue. The ethical terrain created by cloning is complex and like with any scientific data, must be dealt with in a respectful manner to all parties affected and involved. One can criticise cloning using scientific measures, we've already mentioned examples about genetic modification and selecting. One large problem with these modifications is that it is hard to read whether those animals are carrying recessive alleles of genes that can be the basis of certain disorders or diseases. Let's just say a cow gains a recessive allele from, for arachnomelia, which is a defect of skeletal development through the cloning process. If that cow breeds with another cow which has been cloned similarly, their two recessive alleles could become the only allele coding for that gene and become dominant. Not all diseases and disorders are coded by one gene, but the arachnomelia example goes to show what can happen. By manipulating these genes, not only are we interfering with mother nature, we're opening up to unforeseen expressions of genes that have larger ramifications for the ecosystem. The cost of cloning is important to consider, and we can evaluate the issue with some simple mathematics. The international price of one cloned cow is $25,000, and they cost up to $2 a day to look after. A cow in Australia has a life expectancy of 15 to 20 years, and they serve as a dairy cow for five to six years. According to dairyaustralia.com.au, the annual average milk production is 5,761 litres per cow in 2017. Currently, standard milk has a price of a dollar per litre, and for the purposes of this evaluation, let's say that a cow's milk has 10% more casein and now costs 10% more as well. In six years, the cow would produce $38,000, not considering the production costs of the milk. The first $25,000 and the $2 a day for 20 years is $39,600. It's too easy to criticise our assumptions made across the calculation, but you can see that the cost of purchasing a cloned cow and looking after it isn't economically advantageous. This example was also at an industrial scale. Imagine how much it would take to clone a sheep with factor IX for haemophilia B patients. All the benefits come at an expense. It's just a matter of if the cloning gives a bang for your buck. On deontological and virtuous grounds, the playing God problem has to be considered. We could say that cloning is a hubristic attempt by humans to be divine. An important point Dr. Fiesta has touched on in her article is that cloning and many types of genetic engineering cross a line between facilitating the creation of life and engineering life. A method of evaluating this dilemma is to apply various theological principles. The Bible covers principles on virtuous ethics and applying the imagination reveals that cloning is going directly against God's plan for biodiversity. Some small cloning projects are accepted, but any economical benefit or human preference is unacceptable because it's human hubris. The Islamic view is interesting because the application states that the miracle of cloning and our knowledge of genetics is made possible by Allah. However, Sunni Muslims have banned cloning altogether because of its effect on familial intimacy. Shia Muslim leaders have authorised animal cloning and banned reproductive cloning because they believe it's right to use what God has allowed. Hinduism and Buddhism approve of cloning given that animal pain is minimalised. Judaism also approves of cloning. In fact, healing from suffering is a strong imperative in Judaism. It's also important to recognise that many other minority groups may have outstanding views but it's easy to see the discord amongst the religions and how that would have an effect on cloning across the world if some sort of technology is approved in one place but not another. Thank you for listening to our biotechnology documentary. We hope you got something out of it. Cheers! Cheers.